All right. Wendy Troxell, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. So you are a sleep specialist and you have studied how sleep problems manifest in individuals. You also are a therapist. So you help people with their sleep problems as well. But you also you also study how sleep problems can affect society and couples. I'm curious, what led you down that path? Well, when I first started my research career and I was pursuing my doctoral degree in clinical and health psychology, I've always been fascinated by relationships and understanding how and why relationships and frankly, our social environments more generally are so important, not just for our mental health, but also for our physical health. So we know, for instance, that married people or partnered people live longer, happier, and healthier lives than their unmarried or unpartnered counterparts. And it's not just being married that matters for health. It's really being in a high-quality relationship that can provide a real boost to your health, including your risk of chronic illnesses such as heart disease. What we don't know is how do these relationships get under the skin to impact such chronic health conditions like heart disease? And that's when I had this kind of aha moment that I had to start studying sleep and specifically the role that sleep plays in the life of a couple and how sleep may help explain why some relationships are health protective, whereas others may confer health risks. Because we know, of course, that sleep is vitally important for our physical health and our mental health. And it also happens to be the one health behavior that is traditionally shared among couples. And yet very few people in sleep research or throughout the history of sleep science have studied sleep in the social context in which it occurs. I mean, if you just think about the typical sleep laboratory setup, what do we do? We bring individuals into a laboratory under tightly controlled conditions, and we isolate them as much as possible. But this isn't what sleep in the real world looks like. Sleep in the real world is often noisy, interrupted, and most importantly, shared, often with a partner. Okay. So yeah, I, th- I think that's really interesting. That's why I, this book really jumped out to me because you're right. We've had sleep experts on the podcast where we've talked about the, the downsides of having sleep deprivation or you're not getting enough sleep. So we all, we've probably, and people have probably read articles about it. Like if you're not getting enough sleep, you increase your risk for heart disease, as you said, right. Alzheimer's, insulin resistance or diabetes. But then on the like psychological level, sleep deprivation can lead to depression, anxiety, and other mental issues. But then you, yeah, you make this really great case and you've done research on this is that the lack of sleep can also affect or negatively influence our relationships. What does the research say about that? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So it's wonderful that we're all becoming more and more aware of the profound individual consequences of sleep disturbances, ranging from, as you said, our risk for heart disease, uh, depression, anxiety, and even Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. But people are less aware of the fact that, you know, and I I would say it's equally important that there also are profound interpersonal consequences of sleep loss and disruption. So what does the research say? This is coming from both, you know, my research team as well as others. The research clearly has shown that when people are poorly slept, they're more likely to engage in the very types of behaviors that the relationship experts, including the renowned Dr. John Gottman, have deemed to be the most toxic types of relationship behaviors and the behaviors that are most predictive of relationship demise. So this includes the fact, studies have shown, that when we're sleep deprived or we experience sleep loss, we're more likely to display hostile behaviors behaviors. Our frustration tolerance is lower. We're more prone to conflict and we're less able to read our partner's emotions. Add on top of that, the fact that sleep problems can predict the onset of mental health problems like depression and anxiety and substance use problems. And you can really have a toxic combination for relationships. I think that makes sense. I mean, if you have kids, you understand whenever your toddler, your kid doesn't get enough sleep, like one of the first thing you know, they're cranky. Yes. And we think, well, when, that doesn't happen to adults, but no, the same thing happens to adults as well. Absolutely. A child meltdown because of sleep deprivation looks very similar in some ways as an adult meltdown. I mean, maybe we're not 
having a tantrum, but we do become irritable. We are t- we tend to snap at the other person. And when we kind of have those negative uh, behaviors, we're most likely to take it out on our partners. We can kind of, you know, regulate ourselves a little bit more when it comes to our, you know, boss or coworkers maybe, but that irritability and that frustration tolerance which is lowered can really, you know, we're prone to snap at our partner, the person who's, who's always sp- supposed to be there for us. And what causes that increase of frustration sensitivity? Is, is there something going on in the brain because of lack of sleep that would result in us in snapping and just being more irritable? Like what's going on there? Yes. Well, there's really elegant research showing that, you know, sleep plays a key role in our ability to regulate our emotions. And and it also does have an impact on the parts of the brain that are kind of the emotion centers, like the amygdala. So that becomes under sleep deprived conditions, we see an amplification in amygdala responses, which is again, that sort of hot, fiery emotion center. And we actually see a down regulation in the prefrontal area, which is really sort of the reins in the brain system trying to kind of regulate those hot fiery emotions so you have an you know kind of you know up regulation of uh, of the fieriness and sort of the tendency to snap or become angry and less control of our emotions because the down regulation in the prefrontal area so not only that's the other thing you highlight too in the book is not only does sleep deprivation cause us to just be more irritable so when our spouse a partner asks us to do something in the morning and we just like, ah, you know, just bite their head off. Yeah. But it also, it can increase feelings of loneliness too, for some weird reason. Like you actually feel lonelier even when you're sleep deprived, even though you might, you know, objectively not be lonely. You have your spouse, kids, friends. Yeah. Yeah. That feeling uh, of, I mean, you, we can feel lonely even, you know, with a partner and, and that and that's sometimes the, the loneliest place to be. And elegant work um, out of Berkeley has shown that under sleep deprived conditions, people tend to subjectively feel more lonely regardless of what the actual social context is. And what's really cool about that research is that they also showed that loneliness is kind of contagious, that sleep deprived people were rated by external reviewers as being more lonely but the the reviewers themselves after you know sort of looking at these sleep deprived people also felt more lonely themselves so there can be this sort of loneliness contagion and you could imagine in a couple how that kind of if both partner is feeling kind of lonely and disconnected over time that sense of disconnection it is a really powerful predictor of relationship demise. It's when couples start sort of moving apart. Um, they're not quite sure why their relationship is no longer satisfying, that it's not feeding them anymore, but they're just sort of living in separate worlds. And, and that can be very devastating. Okay. So in addition to our sleep deprivation affecting negatively affecting relationships because we get snappier, we feel lonely, we feel disconnected from our spouse or partner. You also, there's research that says the quality of a relationship can also positively or negatively affect our sleep. So what's going on there? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So on the negative side, I think this is kind of intuitively obvious to most people. If you're going through a rough spell in your relationship or if you have a you know conflict with your partner during the day, that can really disrupt your sleep that night because relationship conflict or you know relationship strain is a major source of stress for most people. But here's what's interesting. My colleague, Dr. Brant Hassler, who's from the University of Pittsburgh and I, we did a study a number of years ago in which we measured couples' daily relationship behaviors and nightly sleep quality over a period of about 10 days. What we found was that for men, on nights when they slept worse, the next day they reported poor relationship quality. But for women, we found evidence for the reverse direction, okay? So for women, we found that on days when she reported feeling less satisfied in her relationship, that night, both her sleep and her partner's sleep suffered. So in other words, if she's not happy, no one's sleeping. But what this research shows us with these bi-directional associations, some of which may be gender dependent, you can easily see if sleep is affecting relationships and relationships can in turn affect sleep, you can have this vicious cycle emerge. But I want to mention it's not all negative. There can also be virtuous cycles if we turn this around, wherein if we prioritize sleep and relationship health, we can have healthy sleep begetting healthier relationship behaviors and so on. 
Well, I'm curious. That's interesting. So, yeah, I, I can totally see the vicious cycle happen. You get a bad night's sleep, that affects the relationship. The relationship's bad the next day, and that just makes the next night's sleep bad. Or it could be the opposite way. Bad, you know, fight with your, your spouse, then you get, don't sleep well, and then it just perpetuates. I'm curious, in your research, and also, you're, you're also a therapist. You work with people and couples with, the, with their sleep problems. Have you, is it usually like what precipitates, what starts the vicious cycle? Is it like usually a lack of sleep or is it the, the bad relationship? Like what's the, the, the Kickstarter? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think obviously there's a bit of a selection bias because I'm right. you know, n- known as a specialist. I, I am a general clinical psychologist, but people generally come to me for sleep issues. So I hear a lot about the, you know, the, the sleep disturbances effects on the relationships. However, even in my, you know, clinical sleep context, relationship issues are often a precipitant of sleep problems for, you know, not all all my patients, but many. So, so again, even in the kind of etiology of, of sleep problems that, you know, people will come to me to treat relationship, you know, stress in the relationship or divorce or separation, those are often identified by the patient as, you know, kind of when their sleep problems began. But I also see the other side of that because I'm treating the sleep problems that my patients will acknowledge that, and particularly if their partners come in, they will also acknowledge that the sleep problem in one partner is really having an impact on the couple as a unit. Well, let's talk about that. What are the the problems couples might experience when it comes to sleep? And what issues do you often see with partnered sleeping? Because I think that's an important thing because I think people are typically, I got a sleeping problem. They usually, as you said earlier, it's usually, well, what's my problem? They never think, right. well, how's, my, how's my, my wife or my husband contributing to this? Absolutely. And, you know, here's a big thrust of the book, too, is that we need to kind of get over this idea that, you know, a sleeping problem is my problem or your problem. Because if a couple shares a bed, the bottom line is that problem is a we problem. It is an interdependent phenomenon because sleep is shared for many adults. So we really have to start thinking about it that way and problem solving at the level of the couple. But in answer to your question, in terms of the types of problems that are most commonly faced by couples when sleeping together, and here I mean in the literal sense, not the biblical sense, you know, the big one, of course, that we hear about most frequently is, you know, that one partner snores and that keeps the other partner up. But of course, there are other sleep disorders as well, like insomnia or restless leg syndrome, which can have effects both on the individual as well as the partner. Couples may have differences in sleep-wake schedules or patterns. One's an early bird or a morning lark, and the other's an evening owl, or they may have different work schedules. As any parent will tell you, the presence of children can wreak some havoc on couples' sleep. And then, of course, there are just differences, kind of more mundane, run-of-the-mill differences in sleep preferences or behaviors. Maybe you have differences in preferences for firmness or softness of the mattress, or one of you likes it hot in the bedroom, the other likes it cold. Or maybe one partner likes to um, you know, bring their phone into bed and scrolls uh, through their phone obsessively before falling asleep, whereas the other partner is, is really trying to practice healthy sleep hygiene. So these kind of behaviors are incompatible. And again, the other big point I make in the book is that just because you love a person, you know, and you're committed to them doesn't mean you're necessarily going to automatically be perfectly compatible when it comes to that roughly third of our lives that we spend together in bed. Yeah, it's funny, you know, there's a lot of relationship advice, you know, before you get married, you're supposed to talk about, okay, what are your What's your uh, approach to finances? Yeah, right? you, you talk about that, but never crossed my mind to, to ask my my wife. Like, so are you a morning bird or a night owl? Like, how how's that? Gonna, like, that never crossed my mind at all. Right. I mean, and these are really important things. It's a third of our lives, and you know, it's one of the few things that you know. Again, for most couples, it's actually sh- that entire time period is generally shared together. And we just assume that you know it's going to work or we default to these ideas of how couples should be and that it's just naturally going to work. And you know it doesn't always sort of work that seamlessly. And without having any dialogue about, you know, how do we work through this? I think that it, that can create tension that's unnecessary in couples. So that's again kind of the purpose of the book is to like start the dialogue that you know sleeping together isn't always easy or automatically compatible, but there are strategies to work together, you know, to make it work. 
besides differences in circadian rhythms, can anyone, you know, someone can be a night owl, someone can be an early bird. Are there differences between how men and women sleep that can cause problems, like from like on a physiological basis? Yes, there are a number of biological sex differences in sleep that, of course, can cause particular issues among heterosexual couples. Though, generally speaking, I want to mention that the challenges that couples face when it comes to sharing a bed apply to all types of couples, straight, gay, young, old, newlyweds, or long-term couples. But as far as sex differences go, the short answer is this. Women tend to suffer more from sleep disturbances and sleep disorders characterized by poor sleep quality or kind of lighter, non-refreshing sleep. Like they're more, they're about twice as likely to have insomnia as compared to men. They're also more likely to have restless leg syndrome as compared to men. On the other hand, men are more likely to be loud sleepers. So statistically speaking, at least, men are more likely to be snorers or to have the clinical disorder known as obstructive sleep apnea that's characterized by loud snoring or gasping for air at night, at night, which can be, of course, very disruptive. So you can kind of imagine how among heterosexual couples, the pairing of a sex that tends to be sort of lighter sleep, more prone to sleep disturbances with a loud sleeper could create some conflict in the bedroom. So besides issues between sleep differences between the couple, you also talk about adding kids to the picture can also create problems or exacerbate sleeping problems. What does that look like? Well, you probably don't need me to tell you this. Uh, You just need to ask any parent of a child that the presence of a child has profound impacts on your sleep individually and as a couple. And here's what's actually very interesting. Research shows that after the birth of your first child, couples experience a precipitous decline in their relationship quality. And also, as every parent will tell you, having an infant in the house is a surefire way to become sleep deprived. Now, given what we know about the consequences of sleep loss on our moods, our behavior, and our ability to communicate effectively, it stands to reason that sleep loss can be a major driver of relationship conflict and that sort of deterioration, at least temporarily, in relationship satisfaction when couples become parents. And again, this is also why it's so important for couples to start acknowledging the importance of sleep in the life course of their relationship. Because, you know, thankfully, you know, the sleep problems and sleep deprivation of having a newborn, it doesn't last forever for all you newborn parents out there. But other sleep problems do emerge and, you know, over the course of the development of your children. So I can just tell you as a parent of two teenagers, definitely not the same level of sleep deprivation that I had when they were infants, but there is sleep disruption when you worry about when they'll come home at night, especially with young drivers. So Having children certainly is just another factor that comes to play that can kind of shake up the boat when it comes to couples' sleep. And acknowledging that and recognizing that some of this is very, you know, time limited and related to a very normal, typical part of the life course of a couple. You know, having a newborn, most people will experience some level of sleep deprivation. If you can label it as that, and if you can maybe give your partner some distance, that this is not about you you know, being just a fatally flawed person or a bad person or irritable person. It's really just that you're sleep deprived. That can give some healthy distance and help couples kind of manage these rough spots better. Yeah. And you talk about too, when you bring a kid into the family, particularly a newborn, like have conversations around this, like, what are we going to do to make sure we both get some good sleep? I think it's been a while since I've been a newborn <laughs> parent, but I remember so my wife's a night owl. I tend to be an early bird. And I think when we first had our kids, it was like the, our sort of arrangement was because, you know, babies, you know, newborns, they got to f- eat all the time. Like they, yeah. Yeah, so they got to eat in the middle of the night. So it was like, if it's before two o'clock in the morning, like wife would take care of that. Kate would take care of that. If it was after two or three, then I would get up and take care of it. Now kind of, I guess that worked for us. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think couples who are able to recognize their sleep-wake differences and then use them 
in their favor, that's a really healthy approach. And generally speaking, yes, I mean, the key for couples struggling with the, you know, sort of temporary nature of, you know, sleep deprivation caused by the birth of a child, it may feel like it's lasting forever, but it really doesn't. Finding ways to, you know, help your partner out so that you can maybe, you know, swap nights when one partner is on for the nighttime caregiving duties where the other partner might get that blessed, you know, four to six hour chunk of sleep, which makes a world of difference in those first few months of having a baby. But again, it's it's about sort of acknowledging this exists and it's going to have an impact on us. So how do we work together to avoid uh, the impact harming us you know, more long-term um, in our relationship, really supporting both and recognizing that, you know, feeling slangry, the term for, you know, sleepy plus angry, kind of like hangry, you know, that that's not about your partner being a bad person. It's about the situation, which is causing sleep deprivation. And we know that sleep deprivation can have really profound impacts on your mood and your behavior. Now, I can attest to the fact, even if, after the newborn phase, your kids are still going to mess up your sleep. Like lot, this week <laughs> alone, I've had, we've had two separate kids come into our, our bedroom at like one o'clock in the morning. They had like a leg pain. Like my, I got growing pains. And so we had to like wake up, Tylenol, you know, it's just, it still happens. It still happens. They're 10 and eight. It still happens. Now, the good news is, you know, that, you know, temporary sleep disruptions are, are really not going to kill you. They happen. It's a part, a normal part of life. What we want to avoid is, you know, really chronic disrupted sleep or insufficient sleep over a long period of time. That's what the research shows is really most strongly associated with negative health outcomes. So doing whatever you can to protect your sleep when you can, and you know working with your partner so that you know if you're going through a period uh, a longer period of time for instance where a child is waking up a lot in the middle of the night how do you find ways to maybe sort of reciprocate with your partner to make sure that each of you gets some decent sleep at least occasionally so you don't have that build up of chronic sleep de- deprivation which can have the most negative consequences Another thing you talk about in the book that, you know, some families do, they do shared sleeping. So it's like the baby sleeps with the parents and then they just continues like in the toddlerhood. And some, for some families that works out great. It's fantastic. But then you've also, there's couples you highlighted where that was like, that was the sleep issue. That was a kind of a point of contention in the relationship. Right. So the issue of, you know, family co-sleeping, you know, it's a hotly debated and controversial topic. And from a medical standpoint, what I always say is, you know, co-sleeping, if it's done safely, you know, is really a family level decision. And again, when I say safely, that means that there's appropriate bedding for the for the infant or the child, and that you know that there's not substance use involved on the part of either of the parents. But here's the thing: what is missing for so many families is the actual act of making it a family decision. For some couples and families, the, if it is an active choice to co sleep, it can be you know the right choice for that family. What happens for many families is that it's not an active decision or a proactive and mutual decision. Rather, maybe the infant or child starts, you know, sleeping in the bed because they're having, you know, issues sleeping in their own bed, but the couple never arrived at this decision together. So I've seen clients uh, who come to me with issues with, with their child sleeping, but it's really about issues with the family sleep. And I'll ask one partner, so what's your goal here? And one partner may say, I just want my child to sleep through the night. The other partner will say, I just want my child to sleep through the, through the night in their own bed. Now, those extra words are very different. And before we can problem solve and do anything really effective to support the child's sleep, I have to help the couple come together on, well, what's your couple level goal? Because what's most important for children when it comes to their sleep is following a consistent pattern of behavior and sticking with it. So if there's, you know, those few little word differences in those two statements makes a big difference because if one partner just wants that child to sleep wherever it is, and the other partner wants that child to sleep in their own bed, well, that can lead to a great deal of inconsistency in the kind of routines and behaviors the family will practice throughout the night. All right. So be intentional about shared sleeping, co-sleeping. Don't just slide into it, like actually be yeah, intentional about it. Exactly. Intentionality is key. And, you know, having an open dialogue with your partner about it, about what are our goals and, you know, what are the pros and cons of each? You know, what will this mean both 
currently and you know a few years from now and you know how is this going to work in the context of our relationship and you know couples may have sort of best laid plans to try one approach and they may find that it's not working for them but again that's okay to sort of switch directions but do it in an intentional and proactive way and stick with it because consistency is what's really key for children all right, so let's uh, put aside the issue of family sleeping and there's kids. We're just talking about the couple here. Let's okay. talk about the solutions for sleeping mismatch problems between a, a couple. And the most significant one, I've been reading more and more about this, is for the couple to decide to sleep in separate beds. Now, a lot of people don't want to talk about this idea because sleeping in separate beds seems pretty taboo. I mean, right. The feeling is like, oh, if a couple is sleeping in separate beds, that means the relationship is on the rocks. What's interesting in the book, you explore the cultural history of partnered sleeping and you highlight the fact that throughout history, there's been sort of this, like, this swing back and forth between the acceptance of separate sleeping arrangements and then you know sleeping together. Can you walk us through that history so we can get an idea of like how we as a culture have thought about sleeping arrangements between couples? Yes, this is really a fascinating part of doing the research for my book because I'm not myself a historian, but I had the opportunity to read historical texts and interview some prominent historians, including Dr. Roger Eckert, who wrote the book um, At Day's Close, which gives a historical perspective on how sleep has changed throughout history. It's, it's a brilliant book. So kind of here's what history and historians tell us. I mean, throughout Western history, sleep has been a social behavior and in in fact, in medieval times, sleep wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just the marital bed. It was really the shared communal bed with, you know, family members, even, you know, could be a, a passerby or <laughs> um, uh, servants in the house and sort of where you got to sleep in the bed sort of was a sign of sort of where you fit in the sort of family structure. But then you can fast forward to the Victorian era. And it was at that time de rigueur to be able to sleep in separate bedrooms. It was a sign of prestige in part because only the well-to-do couples could afford to sleep apart. Again, in earlier history, the bed in the bedroom was kind of one of the most prized possessions and the most expensive possessions of a family. So, you know, people could not afford to have separate bedrooms. So in the Victorian era, you know, being able to sleep apart was a sign of, of your wealth. And there were also some half-baked science ideas at the time um, that suggested that disease was spread through foul smells. So you can take that a step further and make the point that, and, and doctors of the time did, that, you know, your partner's morning breath could literally make you sick. So therefore, if you can afford it, best to sleep apart. So it was also a sign of hygiene. Then we jump to sort of the 1950s and we see, you know, popular television shows like I Love Lucy still perpetuating uh, the image of a married couple, both on and off screen, who are sleeping apart. And there were even Hollywood regulations for what could be, you know, acceptable on screen that if a man and a woman were in the same bed, one partner, one person had to have a, a leg on the floor as if this was some sort of like chastity belt, um, keeping them from, you know, any hanky panky, I guess. And then you kind of shift forward again to the sexual revolution and of the 1960s. And we see the pendulum shift in the opposite direction. This is where we start to see this taboo attached to sleeping apart, as if sleeping apart is necessarily a sign of this, you know, loveless or sexless union. It was really this reaction to kind of the, the image of this kind of prudish, you know, behavior of the 1950s and before. And to some extent, we still see that stigma attached to sleeping apart. Although there's some evidence that as more and more couples come out and admit that they're perfectly happy, but you know it's working for them and their relationships for many different reasons to sleep apart, it may be that um, that stigma will start to wane. Uh, again, so the fear is people are like, well, I don't want to do that because that just like it's like a sleep divorce. It's like our, it's a sign that our relationship is on the rocks. Right. But there's also research saying that people who couples who decide to sleep apart. They actually don't have any relationship problems. In fact, it could possibly help the relationship. What's going on there? 
Right. So I, I would actually say that the research specifically on, you know, relationship quality when couples sleep together or apart is pretty limited, though I can absolutely say anecdotally, I've met with many couples who say that sleeping apart has, you know, been the lifesaver for the relationship and they're so much happier. And again, what I say to all couples is that there is not a one size fits all sleeping strategy that's going to work for all couples. What we do know quite clearly from the science is that when you're well slept, you're able to be a better partner. So, you know, regardless of your sleeping arrangements, what couples need to do is prioritize both of their sleep because that will make both of them better partners. And for couples who do decide that sleeping apart makes sense um, in their relationship, I also recommend that it's really important to still kind of savor um, the cuddle or the time that they spend together in bed before falling asleep, because that's often the most important time for sustaining and maintaining a healthy relationship. So I still believe that the the marital or otherwise shared bed really still holds an important place um, in in the life of a couple, and we need to preserve that and avoid the tendency to let you know external factors and distractors like our phones interfere with that really sacred time where couples just get to be together, hopefully for some quality time, whether it be for intimacy or just to talk or cuddle or or digest the stresses of the day together. That's a really important time for a couple, and it often does occur before couples fall asleep. So even if you go your separate ways at bedtime, that's really important to preserve. For other couples who choose to sleep apart, you know there can be some relationship benefits because they have this sort of mini reunion in the morning when they come back together after having a good night of sleep. Or for couples who have you know temporary sleep separations, they've reported that you know they find that it kind of spices up the relationship. Again, I want to make it quite clear that I say throughout my book and whenever I speak on this topic, what I want to avoid is being prescriptive about this in any way to all couples it is not for me or anyone else to tell you how you should be sleeping with or without your partner. It's really about recognizing how important sleep is in the life of your relationship and then finding the strategy that's going to work best for you. Well, so one option that some couples do is they'll get two full-size beds and they'll put them together to form a single bed. So they're still together, but they're, they're also separate. There's a name for it. It's called the Scandinavian method. That could be really helpful if you got one person who's a tosser and turner or who's got restless legs. That kind of thrashing, again, it has both individual effects and couple level effects. So having even a king size bed, even though you can kind of be at your separate corners, if somebody is thrashing enough they, they, or enough of a sheet stealer, they can still grab all your sheets. Um, so the Scandinavian method, it, it typically involves putting two twin beds together because two twin beds equal a king. And it allows both partners to have, you know, their individualized preferences for, you know, the mattress, their, you know, their bedding. And then you can actually, for, you know, some couples, they prefer to have sort of a communal comforter or overlay uh, that's a king size. So, you know, for those who are still a little concerned about the any sort of stigma attached to separate beds, this makes it, you know, look like one king size bed, but the actual beds themselves and the bedding are individualized. And that can work very well for many couples. Okay, so the Scandinavian method uh, this is a good option for sheet stealers, for restless sleepers, or couples where, you know, one person... They want a warmer mattress and warmer sheets. The other person wants a cooler mattress and cooler sheets. Or maybe, you know, you and your spouse get up and go to bed at different times and you want to disturb each other less. So that's a good option. And you found that with couples that that do this, the Scandinavian method, they've got separate beds technically, but maintaining intimacy, this isn't an issue. It's like, you know, we have these really entrenched beliefs that, you know, the the literal meaning of sleeping together and the biblical meaning of sleeping together, i.e. sex, have to be one and the same. And it's absolutely not true. <laughs> you know, there are many ways for couples to find intimacy and, you know, it, it doesn't all only have to happen right before bedtime or in the middle of the night. You know, couples should really be open to, you know, being intimate and having sexual activity when it works for both of them. So if, you know, one of you is an extreme night owl and one is an extreme, you know, morning person, you know, 
you you need to find ways to you know problem solve and find times that you're both going to even be interested and awake for sex because being exhausted is a primary reason why couples don't have sex. So again, prioritizing sleep is good for the relationship in all sorts of ways. So sleeping separate beds or the Scandinavian method where you get separate beds, put them together is one option. Another option you're hearing a lot more about is couples just sleeping. They're, they're doing like Downton Abbey style. Like they're going like mm-hmm. Lord Grantham's got his bedroom and then Lady Grantham's got her bedroom. Like what would cause, I mean, in, in your experience, what would, what causes a couple to make that decision? Sure. Well, I mean, first of all, uh, it depends in in part on sort of your resources and, uh, you know, availability. Not everyone's got a spare bedroom. bedroom. (laughs) Right. Yeah. No one, not everyone lives in Downton Abbey. Correct. So in that way, we're, you know, it's sort of similar to, you know, uh, that time where, you know, separate bedrooms were in fact a sign of prestige. And, you know, if you live in a New York apartment and you're, well, if you're lucky enough to have an extra bedroom, well then have at it. But, you know, so first of all, it can be a resource issues, resource issue, but for those who, you know, you have the space available for a separate bedroom. Generally speaking, um, you know, there's some issues that can, you know, only be solved or, or best be solved by, you know, separate bedrooms. So the Scandinavian method is not going to help the partner who, you know, has a partner who, you know, snores a, a, like a foghorn every night, right? You're, you're going to need to be in, in separate rooms and ideally down the hall from each other if the noise disruption is the primary cause of the sleep disruption. But I also should mention if you know, snoring. And if it's really loud, snoring is the primary cause of sleep disruption. Before you jump to separate bedrooms as being the only solution, it's also really important to encourage your partner um, to, you know, seek medical attention and determine, is this a sleep disorder that could be treated? And that failure to treat can have significant health consequences. Okay. So the takeaway there, if you decide to go, you know, if the sleep incongruencies are so bad, you decide to go separate. Like the, the takeaway there is make sure, again, it's intentional. Yes. Uh, you're not just sliding into it. You're having a conversation about it. And also make sure you maintain a figurative marital bed at some point in the sleep process so that you can maintain just that, just that connection with your, with that your- connection. Right. Right. And, and, and again, that intentionality is so key. And it's something that we just, we don't have practice in doing because there's not a great amount of dialogue around, you know, kind of what's working, what's not working in the bedroom when it comes to sleep. And so what too often happens and where issues can, you know, arise for couples is that, you know, there's never a discussion about sleeping apart. It's just that one partner ends up stomping out of the bedroom onto the couch or kicking her partner out of the bedroom onto the couch. And that's where sort of the resentment can build because there's not a discussion about that this isn't working because neither of us is sleeping well. It becomes really an act of anger and resentment. And then the other partner can end up feeling abandoned. All right. Don't do that. Don't slide into a separate sleeping arrangement. So what if, okay, let's say there's problems like, you know, one, one person in the relationship, they're a morning bird, uh, the other one's a night owl, but they don't want to get separate beds. It's just something they, they enjoy. They want to be together. Any advice there? Like what works? Like what can they do to sort of sync up a bit so they don't uh, disrupt each other's sleep? Absolutely. So what you're talking about is kind of mismatched pairs. One's one's an early bird, one's an evening owl. And I see this quite frequently. And I've talked to a number of couples who struggle with this. And here's one scenario that often happens. It's often that the night owl tries to go to bed at the same time as the early bird, you know, say a reasonable um, time of 10 p.m. Well, the truth of the matter is a bedtime of 10 p.m. is really not reasonable for a night owl. So what happens? The night owl ends up, you know, lying in bed, uh, you know, feeling forced to, you know, go to sleep at a time that their biological clock tells them they're not ready. So what do they do? They lie there in bed, kind of in agony, you know, staring at the ceiling, wishing they could fall asleep. And they simply can't because their biology is working against them. In that kind of situation, resentment can start to build. And then if the, you know, morning is based on the, you know, early bird schedule, then the night owl has to wake up probably long before their biological clock tells them they're ready. And this can result in sleep deprivation for the night owl. 
So it's really important for couples to, first of all, recognize that these differences in sleep-wake preferences, particularly at these extremes, these are genetically derived largely. So you can't just change your sleep-wake preference because, you know, you love someone and you want to be compatible with them. If you do so, that's going to, re- you know, it's working against your biology and that generally doesn't work. And again, you might start to build resentment towards your partner. So what I recommend to couples who are on these mismatched schedules is to find ways to connect and have that quality time together. Again, preserve the cuddle, but it doesn't mean that you, it doesn't mean that you have to go to sleep or wake up at the exact same time. So in the case I gave, you know, the couple could spend some time in bed before the early bird falls asleep, let's say at 10 PM. And when it's bedtime for the early bird, the night owl could quietly leave the room go have some me time, which can be really good for the individual, and then return to bed at their more natural later bedtime. And in the morning, the early bird will wake up at their early time, get out of bed quietly so as not to disturb the night owl and start their day and maybe return later in the morning to wake up their partner ideally with coffee in hand. So these are the kinds of problem-solving strategies that couples absolutely can and, and do, and it will support their sleep in both of them, and also their relationship quality. What's really interesting, uh, there is research on the impact of um, being mismatched in terms of sleep-wake preferences on couples' relationship quality. And, you know, the news is not great. It actually does show that, you know, couples who are mismatched have higher levels of relationship conflict, poor relationship satisfaction, and lesser sexual activity. But the caveat of that research, don't go run off in despair, please, um, is that couples who are mismatched but have good problem-solving skills do not show these relationship impairments. So it's really about the ability to problem-solve and, as you mentioned, being intentional about your behaviors and finding solutions that are going to work for you as a couple. So you don't have to fall asleep at the same time to still have some time to share some time in bed before either of you falls asleep, or maybe it's in the morning. There's all sorts of strategies that can work, but it's about being intentional and proactive about it and bringing the conversation about sleep into your life as a couple. So what do you hope people walk away with? Like, What's the big takeaway? You want readers of your book, it's called Sharing the Covers. What do you want them to take away or walk away with after they finish the book? Uh, Great question. So, I mean, I guess what I want to impress upon people with my book is that, first of all, for far too long, we've lived in a culture that has undermined the importance of sleep. But we're, you know, even that's starting to change as we recognize the individual consequences of sleep. But if that's not enough uh, to change your behaviors and help you prioritize sleep for your own sake, then I want you know, to impress with the with the book and the data and the research that I provide, that if you're not going to sleep for yourself, then do it for everyone else around you. And most importantly, your closest relationships. We really need to start focusing um, on like sleep as being so vital for the health of our relationships. And if you're struggling as a couple to sleep well, you know, there's not a reason to despair because there are strategies that work, but we first have to start having a dialogue around, you know, the importance of sleep as a couple, and then we can start problem solving and finding strategies that will both improve your sleep and your relationship health. And that's exactly what the book is intended to do, to provide couples with actionable techniques that can improve both of their sleep and in turn improve the relationship health, recognizing that these two things are inter intricately intertwined. Well, Wendy, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? The book, again, is available online at all major retailers. It's called Sharing the Covers, Every Couple's Guide to Better Sleep. I'm also on Twitter, Wendy Troxel, and you can also check out my website, wendytroxel.com. All right. Well, Wendy Troxel, thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. My guest today was Dr. Wendy Troxell. She's the author of the book, Sharing the Covers. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find out more information about her work at her website, wendytroxell.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash shared sleep, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.